What's up guys, Western Teeny here. I'm going to be looking at a game from my childhood today in the next couple of weeks called Warzone 2100. This first part is just talking so just bear with me for at least a little bit. This is episode 0 of a multi-part series. Because of the nature of the game, I'm not going to be able to explain game features and talk about the game during the actual gameplay. I feel the story of how the game came to be is just as important as how the game works. Not everybody digs that and I understand which is why I'm making a separate episode. If you don't like introductions, go ahead and skip to episode 1. Just keep in mind that I'm not going to have time to explain game mechanics and other things about the game in future episodes. Warzone 2100 is an open source RTS and RTT game. That's real-time strategy and real-time tactics. They are two totally different subgenres of the overall larger genre of strategy, so try not to mix them up. RTS is actions as they are happening, the now. An example would be StarCraft. Real-time tactics is planning for the future and where every decision can affect future gameplay. An example of that would be XCOM. Because of the nature of this game, and because I've been in it and know what happens, this doesn't make for very exciting gameplay. So this is uh this is where my base this is where they start me, so I'm gonna start building my base here. I'm gonna go ahead and build that thing right there and I'm gonna start building a factory right there. Um Looks like this guy's almost done building his oil dirt. Construction so completed. Let me start building another one. And I'll just wait for my factory to be built. So how was your day? The actual playthrough is going to be heavily edited with me explaining what I do as I do it and because I've been in the game so many times, it's going to be more of a walkthrough really with an attempt at showing you what's going on in my head as I'm doing it. Strategy games have always been my favorite genre of PC gaming ever since my dad introduced me to Red Alert. I kind of want to showcase some of the games I grew up with and depending on how well this series goes I do have a large collection of other older games similar to this game that I plan on playing. But that's enough about me, let's talk about the actual game. Warzone 2100 was originally developed by Pumpkin Studios and was published by Eidos Interactive which is now Square Enix Europe. The game came out in 1999 for Windows PC and PlayStation 1. It was Pumpkin Studios first and last game and was one of the few cross-platform games as far as PC console at the time. Pumpkin Studios closed its doors on March 13th, 2000. After creating Warzone 2100, Pumpkin Studios took over an ill-fated project called Saboteur from developer Tygon. Eidos decided to pull out of the PlayStation 1 market and move on to the next-gen consoles and they cancelled the project and cut funding. Without funding, Pumpkin Studios shut down operations. In 2004, the source code was released for the game, and in 2008, the CG movies and music was allowed for limited use. The game is currently actively developed by the Warzone 2100 project, who update it regularly with bug and balance fixes and expanded the multiplayer aspect. It's available for free in the link down below in the description. I originally played this game in 2000 on PlayStation 1, but I'm currently playing this game on PC via the Warzone 2100 Project 3.1 build. Bear in mind that the original graphics are from 1999, and even without the changes that the Warzone 2100 Project brought to the game, the graphics were pretty good for the time. You had full 3D terrain and slopes, which was revolutionary for the time. The atmospheric techno fits the feel of the game well, and the sound effects don't sound artificial, fake, or computer generated. Audio sounds natural, allowing you to be further immersed. However, I highly recommend the project's PC version of the game as opposed to vanilla or an emulator just for ease of use and the improvements they've made. The story was left intact, however AI, graphics, sound, and the multiplayer aspect of the game was upgraded a bit, but not to the point where it's unrecognizable to veterans of the game. Small things like improved textures, fans um, buildings getting animated, things like that you don't really notice at first, but really add to the game. Support for high resolution displays was added, so the game looks reasonably good on large monitors. I'm currently playing and recording on a widescreen monitor, and the game looks fantastic. The game offers a variety of different mission types and well-implemented combat to break up the monotony. 
missions range from simple scouting missions, quick grab and runs, and the classic search and destroy. You go to away missions via the transport ship with a limited number of units, so choose what you load up on your first wave wisely. When you're not liberating the wasteland, you're given the opportunity to build bases. Each building can be further upgraded as you progress through the game. You advance by collecting artifacts and use research stations to unlock over 400 different types of new technologies such as weapons, buildings, and other upgrades. There's a variety of weapons that each have a strength and counter, and most of your vehicles are custom designed by you, allowing for thousands of combinations and possibilities. Machine guns and flamers do well against your run-in-the-mill scavenger raider, but if they were to ever get better weapons, you best adjust accordingly while maintaining a decent non-combat support force. Overall, you have the ability to create up to 2,000 unique designs. To build a unit, you must first have the necessary components researched, and then you must design the schematics in the unit design menu. You have to pick tracks, a body, and a turret. For turrets, you have several different options of support, command, and attack. As you discover more artifacts, you unlock more options for all three, all with their own respective uses. Once your design is to your liking, you can save the unit and then proceed to produce that unit in a factory. As units fight, they gain experience making them stronger and making it in your best interest to keep them alive. However, in a game of constant upgrading, they quickly become obsolescent. You have the ability to recycle damaged or owed units, regaining a small amount of energy. New units produced will gain the rank of the recycled unit. Just like in the old days of yore, oil still makes the vehicles and factories run. It's the ultimate booty and highly contested. Everything from base building to research and unit production requires resources in the form of energy. Energy is acquired through the game by building oil derricks on these markers, or by collecting oil barrels throughout the map. Much like in the real world how unprocessed crude oil is useless, you must have power generators to convert this energy into usable form. Most oil derricks are an unlimited resource, but are vulnerable to attack and often are far from the main base. Because of this, they have to be protected. You lose too many and your entire operation could be crippled. Thanks in part to the Warzone 2100 project, there is an active multiplayer community, many of whom are very friendly towards less experienced players. Current multiplayer adds an entirely different experience to the game that the original version lacked, but I won't be going into the multiplayer too much for this playthrough. There's more information on multiplayer on the Warzone 2100 Project's website. This is an old game, and old games do tend to have issues. Even with the Warzone 2100 Project tweaks, there's still some very obvious flaws in the game that are built in the engine. Pathfinding just sucks. Units spend way too much time getting caught on each other. This is the game's only biggest flaw that I can really say, and it's not too big an issue early game, but there's workarounds that you have to use later on when you get larger and larger armies. Warzone 2100 is one of those rare gems you've never heard of. Had I had not had found a demo of this game on my Gex the Gecko for PlayStation 1 game, I would have missed this game entirely. I highly recommend this game to anyone who's a fan of strategy games. Again, download link is down below in the description. This game isn't a completely original idea, even in the 90s, but is pretty unique for an RTS game. The intro always reminded me of Fallout 1's The War Never Changes. Much like Fallout, there's a bleak and depressing outlook in the wastelands, but there's one ray of hope. Instead of Fallout's Vault Dweller, it's up to the project, and one skilled and very lucky commander to save us all. To close out on episode 0, let's look at the story intro. Thank you for watching, I'll talk to you next episode. The NASDA system was developed to protect us. It was to be the ultimate nuclear deterrent. As it turned out, it was our executioner. Reports said that NASDA developed a fault during a routine systems check. Don't believe it. Someone wanted it to take us out.
Those nukes were targeted on every major city around the world. NASDA was programmed to start the collapse. When the counter-strikes launched, its laser defenses and anti-missile ground sites failed. The world as we knew it ended. The nuclear winter hit hard. Disease and famine claimed most of us who had survived the nuclear strikes. Wars over cans of dog food took even more. We'd fled Seattle early in 86. We'd heard that the Rocky Mountains were relatively rad-free. After fighting off bands of marauders, we came across the base. Its personnel were dead. Killed by any one of a number of virulent diseases. We cracked the doors and cleared out the bodies inside. We knew that things would never be the same again. But we were determined to build a new world out of the ruins. We rebuilt the landing pads and brought the old systems back online. We were finally ready to begin the project. <laughs> Mission successful. 